So thank you very much, Antoine, for the invitation and for the nice introduction. So as uh, Antoine said, my background is more actually solid state physics. And you will see that So I come more from the electronic structure DFT side. So I am less experienced in molecular dynamic simulations, but you will see that I will still comment some things. So to start with defining what we are talking about. So what is a machine learning force field or a machine learning potential? So the target is to start from an atomic structure. So in this case, you have a solid, but it can be also a liquid or a polymer, something, a surface maybe. And what you want to predict is the energy of this structure in order to be able to find, uh, for instance, the minimum energy uh, structure. Uh, and also the forces acting on, on atoms if you want to predict the dynamics of the system. And to do this, uh, you can use a force field, in our case, a machine learning force field. So the idea is really to go from this whole structure to the total energy of the structure, the forces acting on atoms, and the stress of the structure. And the reference da data is typically energy forces and stress from density functional theory that uh, Antoine introduced in the previous lecture. So in typical machine learning force fields, uh, there are several uh, different possibilities, but let's say that the most spread uh, technique is to use atomic positions to build descriptors of the local environments. So instead of using the whole structure here, you will use locality to focus on the environment around one atom and use that to predict the force acting on this atom. So the machine learning methods can be, for instance, neural networks, but it can be also a Gaussian process regression or linear methods. So you use a basis set and you combine that. So this is an example, for instance, of a neural network application, one of the pioneer papers in the field, uh, Bela Parinello, 2007. Uh, this is an example of uh, Gaussian process regression in 2010 by Bartok Parte and, and collaborators. And this is another example of a so-called linear method that is actually a bit more complex, but you will see. So the, the trend, if you look for uh, the number of documents for machine learning force field and your network potential and so on, you can see that it starts to increase around yeah, 10 years ago, more or less. Uh, but there is also a question of vocabulary, you know, because for instance, those two papers, they, they are not in the set that you find if you do this kind of query. But you can see that, that there is a, a real change in the field of uh, force fields, let's say. So why are force fields useful? Uh, to perform molecular dynamic simulations, Monte Carlo simulations, phonon calculations, to access, for instance, the structure of liquids, uh, to work on alloys, on extended defects such as dislocations, and for instance, the dynamics of dislocations, to work on surfaces and interfaces, uh, on vibrational properties, diffusion, for instance, uh, lithium diffusion in an electrolyte, uh, fracture properties, macromolecules, uh, chemical reactions inside a liquid or electrochemical reactions, etc. And what I want to point out here is that you can do, you can perform molecular dynamics from uh, ab initio using, uh, for instance, density functional theory. And in general, it is considered as relatively accurate. Of course, it depends on the system, it depends on the material, but it is slow. And it scales relatively badly with the size of the system. Uh, typical DFT methods will scale as n cubed with n, the, the number of electrons. And uh, of course, you have well, some specific cases of methods that are designed to scale better. But this is typically uh, difficult to access the time scales to work on this kind of properties and also the system scales. Uh, on the other side of the, of the spectrum, you have force fields method with, let's say, classical force fields, such as Leonard Jones potentials with bonds and so on and that are used typically to work on very big molecules, uh, such as proteins. Uh, and uh, those 
are very fast, but they are not quantitatively accurate in general. So the idea with machine learning force field is to keep the accuracy of the FT methods, but at a much lower cost. And you will see that, however, we are still not at the speed of classical force fields. So there are still things that cannot be accessed at the time with machine learning force fields, but this is evolving actually very quickly. So we can expect that in the near future, indeed, the whole field of molecular dynamic simulations will uh, completely change as, uh, as Antoine was mentioning before. So yes, machine learning potentials aim at keeping the DFT accuracy at a lower cost to access larger system and longer time scales. So this is the, the main message. And when I was preparing this seminar, I encountered this paper, which is actually from this field of uh, classical force fields from 1994 by Ercolesi and Adams. And if you read the abstract, you realize that all the philosophy behind those machine learning methods is actually already there. So here they are talking about the force matching method because one of the reason why this works is that here you are regressing to total energy of the structure, but this is only one value. Stress is also uh, only a few values, but atomic forces, you can find many in this structure. You have a few hundred atomic forces. So what is uh, uh, very important when you are fitting a machine learning force field is the number of those atomic forces. So here, we are, the, the authors were trying to derive an interatomic potentials by matching DFT forces. And what they mention is that, okay, we present a new scheme to extract numerically optimal interatomic potentials from large amounts of data produced by first principle calculation. So already you find this uh, central idea. The method is based on fitting the potential to ab initio atomic forces of many atomic configurations, including surfaces, clusters, liquids, and crystals at finite temperature. So here you have the idea of uh, transferability, let's say, of a general potential that can address several systems and the extensive data set overcomes the difficulties encountered by traditional fitting approaches when using rich and complex analytic forms. So that, that is also another uh, central idea behind machine learning potentials is that you will have something with many more parameters than what was uh, used in the field before. And at the end, you construct a potential with a degree of accuracy comparable to that obtained by initial methods. So, now, if we talk about the, the reference data, I'm just going to say a small word about the precision and accuracy of density functional theory me methods compared to experiment and also themselves. So this was a very nice review uh, of all, let's say, well, many of the DFT codes that are available at the time. And the target of the, of the article was to compare different DFT codes for, let's say, the same exchange correlation functionals with very tight convergence criteria. And we, you, what you can see here in the case of the lattice parameter of silicon is that you have a spread that is relatively small of about uh, 10 to the minus 2 angstrom, which is uh, further away from experiment. And if you compare different exchange correlation functional, you will find a similar spread, let's say, as the one of uh, this uh, PBE value compared to experiment. So now if we talk about um, energy precision, typically you will have a precision of the order of 1 mEV uh, per atom for the FT methods. And again, maybe 5 to 10, 10 times more if you start comparing different uh, exchange correlation functionals. So moreover, there are now a lot of DFT calculation available. It is rather easy to produce DFT data. So here I give you an example with repositories of uh, DFT data. You have hundreds of millions of calculations that are available. But in general, you cannot use directly this kind of data. Uh, this was the original target of this kind of repository, and they are still uh, working in the standardization and curation of those databases. But in general, if you want to construct a potential, you cannot just uh, feed your potential with uh, random data because those will have uh, different convergence criteria, different functionals, and so on and so forth. So at the end, uh, 
many people end up building a dedicated training set for their specific question. So now I'm going to give you some numbers because as you have seen, uh, the question of performance and uh, the question of precision is central to this field of uh, machine learning potentials. Uh, typical interatomic potentials, let's say, old style, use uh, 10 of, or hundreds of parameters with the local atomic structure descriptors entering fixed form functions, so analytical, analytical functions. Uh, machine learning potentials are more one or even maybe two order of magnitudes uh, bigger for the number of parameters. And the idea again is to be able to systematically increase the size of the basis of environment descriptors. And in terms of training set size, uh, it is of the order for the typical application that I have found of 100,000 to millions of atoms computed, of course, by batches of uh, supercell of typically a size of uh, 100 atoms, let's say. And the root mean square error compared to uh, DFT data is of the order at the end of a few milliEVs per atom, so close to DFT precision. So this is an example, for instance, of uh, well, what is so-called physics-informed neural network in which actually uh, the, the classical interatomic potentials are still used and the neural network model is used to uh, find the parameters entering those interatomic potentials with the aim of being uh, more controlled in terms of extrapolation. And you can see here a number of parameters is of the order of a thousand. Uh, this was for uh, just a, a single element potential actually and root mean square error of about 3 milliEV per atoms. This is another example with a multi-species uh, uh, middle entropy uh, alloy, so four different uh, chemical species. And again, you have uh, about 1,000 parameters for uh, root mean square error below uh, 10 to the minus 2 EV per angstrom. So, what is at the heart of uh, this technique, and, and which, is, which was proposed by, by Bella and Painello, is to assume locality. So typically, for instance, in the field of uh, phonon calculations, uh, the, the forces between two atoms are important within 5 to 10 angstroms. So whether it, can, it, it is the second order force constants when you displace one atom, and, and look at the force acting on this particular atom or two body terms. And the loss function, again, is, uh, let's say, a sum of energies, forces, and stress that you obtain from DFT data. So the idea is to split the total energy of the whole system in a sum of atomic energies within a cutoff. So this is a cutoff function. You can imagine different cutoff functions. Again, the cutoff is of the order of 5 to 10 angstrom. And the, the question is to be able to describe the environment in a way that uh, respects the symmetries of the systems, and in particular those of translation uh, or rotation of the system, or inversion, permutation of atoms, and so on. So typically, in, uh, you have dif different methods that have been proposed, but typically, at the end, you end up with a description of the, the radial part of this environment. So in this case, you have a sum of uh, Gaussian values that here are centered around some particular uh, point, but in general, this is actually zero. So you have a sum of uh, Gaussian values with, a, with the cutoff. And you have angular terms, so here, with uh, the angle between three different atoms. And the main point is that the choice of the symmetry functions and their parameters is not unique. And many types of functions can be used as long as the set of function values is suitable for describing the environment of an atom. So this is another example in the case of moment tensor potentials. And in this case, the basis functions are built from those uh, so-called moment tensors in which, again, you have a radial part that is actually a function of Chebyshev polynomial. And uh, here, an angular part that is a uh, tensor resembling moments of inertia. So yeah, this is a list of all the possible descriptors that have been proposed from the review of uh, Jörg Beller. And obviously, I'm not going to discuss all of them, but many of them have this, uh, different, this uh, same spirit of having a radial description and an angular description of the system.
So now if we talk a bit about performances, uh, well, there is no miracle, right? Uh, computational cost uh, scales with accuracy, is correlated with accuracy. So the more basis functions you have, the more parameters you have, uh, the longer it takes to compute, but the, the, the better precision you get when you try to fit your, your DFT data. So those are typical ideas of, uh, well, you have different methods, but in general, you, you see that the Pareto front is uh, relatively similar. And again, you can see that the classical potentials, although those potentials are already relatively involved for classical potentials, are still faster than those uh, machine learning methods. So when you want to use a machine learning force field, you always have to think about whether it will be able to give you uh, the time scales and, and length scale that you want, and also whether it is worth training a full force field instead of just using DFT right away. Because uh, as I was mentioning, 100,000 or a million atoms uh, uh, computation is still very expensive. And those are examples of how it scales with the system size. So basically, it scales linearly with the system size, more or less. So that is the main advantage. So typically, you train with DFT on this order of the number of atoms. And because of the locality, then you can address much larger system. So now, one of the main questions you have when you are uh, training those force fields is the question of extrapolation. So how uh, well you can trust the potential out of the domain in which it has been trained, and how to select your training set in order to be very efficient and to avoid computing useless structures. So here I'm presenting two uh, main techniques. One is ensemble learning, so you train several models. It can be done with a neural network, but also with other models. And uh, you have a committee decision that allows you to observe the deviation of the prediction in different areas. And the idea is that where there is a big deviation of uh, your, your ensemble learning, you, have to, you can select the, the configurations to compute with DFT. Another criterion that I find very interesting, so that was proposed in this field by uh, the group of Shapiev, but here I'm following actually the presentation of this uh, more recent paper that I found much more straightforward, is the so-called deoptimality criterion that is presented here for the case of a linear model in the sense that the atomic property here depends linearly on the, the basis set here but it can be generalized to nonlinear models also. And so here you have your, your basis. So you have a list of basis functions. And here, the big N is the number of atomic environments. So at the end, you are looking for a correspondence between uh, this list of uh, basis set and atomic environments and the atomic property. So this is typically what is done when you train the potential. So you have this matrix that is, uh, well, not square at all, and overdetermined. And the idea is that you want to find the list of uh, atomic descriptors that maximize the volume of this square matrix. And if you find that, that means that uh, all the other uh, atomic environments can be described as a linear combination of the basis that you have here. And because it maximizes the volume, so with the determinant of this matrix, then what is called the grade here, which is the maximum of all those linear coefficients, is smaller than one. So now if you are looking at a different atomic environment, you can again express the atomic environment as a function of those bases, and you can try to track the value of the grade. And this is a way to define whether you are interpolating or extrapolating. So this is what was shown in this paper, that indeed the extrapolation grade is well correlated with the first error. And this was a strategy proposed to, uh, let's say, learn 
during a molecular dynamics simulation. So uh, ab initio molecular dynamics would scale uh, as the number of uh, calculations that you make. Now, what, this, what they call here by no learning on the fly means that here you stop selecting new configuration and you stop adding new configurations to your training set. But what happens is that your simulation fails at some point because it enters a domain that you have not computed and unphysical forces start to appear. What they call classical learning of, on, on the fly is when you add, after a given number of steps, a new configuration, regardless of uh, whether the configuration is inside already the, the training set, more or less, or uh, if you are extrapolating at this point. And it still fails at some point. But now, if you use this extrapolation grade criterion and you stop the simulation after, let's say, you find that the, the atomic environment is above some threshold value, and you start adding this configuration to your set, at the end, you manage to obtain a potential that allows you to perform a full simulation without failing and minimizing the number of new calculations that you make. So if we compare ensemble learning and this de-optimality criterion, they uh, produce similar results. So in this case, there were three sets. So the, the green one is the training set. So you can see that indeed, of course, the, the grade is smaller than one. So everything for the green set is interpolating. And the main question is whether we are extrapolating for the red set. And you can see that indeed all configurations with big errors are uh, located with a big grade. And it is the same with ensemble learning with the deviation of the force. So here you have histograms, again, of the number of configurations compared to uh, the, the test error. And you can see that the optimality return and the ensemble learning produce similar results. So this is a very recent paper by the group of uh, Ralph Drauz, and that I find very illustrating in this case. If we keep discussing this paper, what you can see again is here a different, uh, particular strategy of learning during a molecular dynamic simulation, similar to the one that I was discussing. But in this case, they were varying the threshold of the selection grade to, to, to select new configurations and the threshold to stop the simulation. So you have different strategies that, that you can propose. And what I want to point out here is that is not only the question of the root mean square error that you want to minimize, but also the maximum error, which uh, is somehow controlling how uh, badly you extrapolate. So this is well controlled by this strategy. And what I want to show also is that, of course, if you increase the size of uh, the domain that you sample, then you should expect the root mean square error to, to increase during the process. <coughs> And again, this shows you that uh, it is uh, more performant than just sampling at random. And now, I also want to discuss this extrapolation part. So in this group, they are using actually the atomic cluster expansion, which is relatively physical and is based on an expansion uh, of uh, atomic orbitals, such as the one that Antoine presented in the lecture. And what you can see is that in the case of the deformation of uh, copper, with, well, copper is a relatively simple case, I have to say, to be fair. But here they were training only in the gray area. And what you can see is that you still manage to sample the DFT surface outside of the range in a relatively reasonable way. And again, you find that in the areas in which you are further away from the DFT value are the ones with the, the bigger uh, grade. So, what? Well, yes, well, it, 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 per, per atom, but yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, in this case, they, they just move a single atom. Uh, now, this is more a uh, question of future developments, but I 
think that this is really going to, to, change, the, to change the field because as I was discussing, usually you are computing, you are training with a DFT configuration that is limited in size and then you are extrapolating in your uh, machine learning simulation to bigger size, bigger systems. But that uh, creates a big problem because in some particular cases, uh, this is not representative of your problem. So you are performing a DFT simulations with periodic boundary conditions and it is hard to sample the local environments that really corresponds to the problem you have at hand. And with the criteria that I have uh, discussed before, it is actually possible to identify within a much bigger simulation the local environment, then you extract the local environment and the question is, are you able to perform a DFT simulation that is still representative of this environment? So in this case, they propose to add periodic boundary conditions and to minimize the positions of the, of the outer atoms. And you can see that it seems that the grade of this structure is indeed representative of the one in the bigger structure. You have other possibilities such as uh, computing an isolated cluster of atoms. But I think this is go really going to be central to building force fields for uh, bigger problems, such as the one that, that I was discussing with big interfaces or uh, chemical, electrochemical problems. Another development that I want to mention is going beyond locality, because in some cases you have long range interactions such as uh, electrostatic interaction. And the question is how do you deal with that given that you have made this assumption of locality for your machine learning force fields. So this is a classification of uh, four generation of neural network potentials proposed by Jörg Beller. So the first generation was actually even simpler because there was no local description of the atoms. So that was restricting strongly the size of the system that you can address. It was a direct regression from atomic coordinates to uh, let's say DFT value. So this was the, the second generation was the one that I presented you already. Then the third generation, the idea is to compute the charges from the local environment. So in the same way as you can make a regression of energies and forces, you can do a similar things for charges or for instance for a, a spin on, on an atom. And using those charges, you can compute electrostatic values. Now, fourth generation is dealing with another problem that is introduced here. So you can have actually long range effects on the charges. For instance, in this, the case of this molecule, you have a hydrogen here and it actually has an effect even there. So which means that if you start computing the charge with only the local environment, you will not see this difference. You will not see this difference. And this is central also in the case of uh, electrochemical systems, because you can have the potential acting on the system, the charge on the electrode has to be equilibrated and so on. So people are thinking along those lines uh, in order to build more complicated neural network that will use both the local environment to uh, predict most of the properties, but at the same time use global information on the charge of the system in order to deal with these non-local non effects. So now I'm going to show you a few uh, examples of uh, things we have done in our group uh, with the target of uh, showing you that you can do new things that were not possible with density functional theory and that can be done with those machine learning force fields. So in this case, uh, it was a neural ne network potentials with a very simple description that was actually uh, only radial. And uh, so this is the case of uh, aluminum. And what you can see is that over a long range, because we were changing the lattice parameters and adding vacancies in a long uh, range of energies, you have a very good fit, actually, with a root mean square error of uh, below 1 millieV per atom, and also on the forces. And with that, for instance, well, 
Yes. No, they are not equilibrium configuration. So this is through uh, different molecular dynamics run, typically. Okay. And with molecular dynamics, you can also predict this kind of curve, which are the vibrational density as a function of a temperature with velocity autocorrelation functions. And in this case, so we were adding a vacancy in the system. And for instance, this is the, the energies when you move an atom closer or further away to the vacancy. So you have a force that is repulsing the atom to this to its equilibrium positions in both cases. And the main problem in that work was to explain those experimental uh, values for the, the Gibbs free energy of formation of the vacancy. So there are many uh, speculations in the literature whether there are di vacancies or only mono vacancies, but the energy is influenced by uh, anharmonicity. So typically, the dependency that you expect is that of an Arrhenius law, which would be like this, with constant values for the enthalpy of formation and the entropy of formation of the vacancy. And in one paper using uh, DFT calculation, uh, it was shown that anharmonicity strongly changes the shape of the entropy of formation of the vacancy, and that explains this experimental fit. But actually what we show in this paper with enhanced sampling compared to DFT is that the Arrhenius slow is, fulfi is fulfilled until about 600 Kelvin, at which point, indeed, anharmonicity starts to take place, starts to take place, and changes the dependency of this uh, vacancy formation energy. So this is purely because, with density functional theory, you cannot access uh, such degree of, uh, of precision. Typically, another example is the one of uh, this mixed uh, oxide. Uh, cobalt manganese 3 or 4. So you have a spinel structure. So in a spinel structure, you have two different kinds of environments for the transition metal. You have tetrahedral sites and octahedral sites. And when you start putting cobalt to replace manganese, you see that there is a large diversity of uh, atomic environment that is accessible. And typically for uh, X equal 0.5 and a supercell that describes the structure of 56 atom, which is not so large, you have already millions of possibilities. So in this case, this is really like the hard discount uh, version of the machine learning potential. It's not a force field. We are only fitting to equilibrium energies. So we have no forces in the, in the, in the, in the problem, which uh, is why we cannot use uh, f uh, machine learning potentials with many parameters. So in this case, it has only 150 parameters. And typically, this is a case in which a neural network potential, such as the one that I was presenting before, would not perform so well. <coughs> and this is a comparison to uh, more simple models of extended midfield. And using that, you can see that you are able actually to uh, compute formation energies of very different structures. So here, the one, the structures that I was showing before were computing, computed with DFT, but in this case, the order in which we change, we substitute the manganese atom for the cobalt is uh, fixed, let's say. It, we start by substituting in all octahedral sites and then substituting in tetrahedral sites or the opposite way around. But now if you start substituting at random, you obtain a much bigger dispersion of the formation energy depending on the structure. And when you start to access very high uh, temperatures, such as the one that are used for this compound that is a potential candidate for thermochemical storage, you see that the dispersion of this formation energy is very important to predict, for instance, properties such as the solubility gap. So now I will go a bit off topic for some time and, and talk about anharmonicity in perovskites. <clears throat> 
So the perovskite structure is uh, typically like this. So you have an octahedron of oxygen and an atom in the middle. And they like to exhibit many different transitions because of the freedom that, that you have in this uh, octahedron of oxygen. So you can have rotations of the octahedron, you can have uh, uh, distortions, you can have this central atom that moves up, and up or down. And for instance, in the case of baryon titanate, you start from the high uh, symmetry cubic structure and you have one, two, three transitions when you go down to zero Kelvin. And this is linked to a big change of the dielectric constant. If we take the case of strontium titanate, it is a little bit simpler. You have one transition around 100 Kel and 10 Kelvin, and you, in which you start from the cubic symmetry and you have a rotation of the octahedron. So if you start computing the phonon spectrum from DFT, this is what you find. So here the negative frequencies are actually uh, imaginary frequencies. And why are they imaginary? Because they correspond to a negative energy around, uh, uh, along that phonon mode. So in this case, you have several unstable modes that you find at R and gamma. And at 300 Kelvin, the experimental spectrum is of course stable. So typically, the way phonon, uh, phonon spectra are, can be calculated in real space is with small displacements. So you start with your atomic structure, you displace an atom, and you compute the forces on all atoms. And that gives you so-called second order force constants that allow you to go back to the phonon spectrum. Now, if you displace two atoms, you can compute the uh, third order force constants. And using those two quantities with the Boltzmann transport equation, you can compute, for instance, the thermal conductivity. So now, a method that uh, we have implemented to deal with uh, finite temperature phonon calculations in order to be able to predict this kind of uh, spectra at high temperature is uh, the quantum self-consistent ab initio lattice dynamics, in which, starting from the phonon spectrum, if you take the assumption of a harmonic model of atomic vibrations, you can compute the thermal displacement matrix and generate a list of configuration of displaced atoms that correspond to the statistical uh, uh, ensemble of displaced configuration. So now you can compute all forces on this set of configuration and map it on an effective model with second and third order force constants. With those new force constants, you can regenerate a phonon spectrum. And what can be shown is that when this scheme converges, you are actually minimizing the free energy of the system for a model of uh, harmonic uh, oscillators. So now, if you do this on strontium titanate, you find indeed that there are two soft modes, one at gamma and one at R, which is the one responsible for the transition and you can follow the evolution of those modes as a function of temperature. Uh, it compares relatively well with uh, other methods and with experiment. Although, again, you have to take into account that if you start changing the DFT functional, this can change quite a lot, actually, because those are very small energy scale. At, at the end, uh, 50 Kelvin is like 4 mEV. So. And yes, the, what I want to mention here is that uh, in this case, it was really a benchmark paper. So I put a lot of effort in estimating those error bars. So those were relatively heavy to produce, uh, computationally speaking. But you are still uh, left with a deviation of the order of 50 Kelvin. What you can do also is compute the thermal conductivity. So this is an example of a, high throughput study of a pair of skites at high temperature. And what was interesting that I mentioned in passing is that we find that the thermal conductivity of those compounds have a general trend that deviates from the expected linear trend because of those soft modes, typically. And what you can do also from the phonon spectrum is to compute the dielectric constant of those compounds as a function of temperature. So now we wanted to tackle the case of potassium tantalate, which is also a pair of skites and is interesting because it is a quantum paraelectric. So if you look uh, 
at the potential energy surface, you find that there should be a ferroelectric distortion in which the tantalum atom will move up or down. But it is not found to be ferroelectric because the quantum fluctuations stabilize this unstable phonon branch even at zero Kelvin. So now what we did is that we replaced the DFT part of this method in which we were computing the forces by a machine learning force field. Because indeed, this was the main bottleneck in the calculation. And it proved to be extremely efficient, so efficient that we had to re-optimize the code because this became the, the bottleneck compared to the uh, calculation of forces. So in this case, it was moment tensor potentials. And uh, what you find is, again, uh, good agreement for the forces of a relatively uh, large range. So those were uh, typically sampled over a few temperatures. So still with uh, uh, harmonic-like displacements. And now, if you do a similar thing as that of uh, strontium titanate, you see that you can attain a much bigger precision that you couldn't dream of with DFT, except uh, with a crazy computational cost. And then you can access the dependence of this ferroelectric soft mode and look and, and, and realize that below 10K, indeed, the frequency of the soft mode saturates simply because the population of the mode is dominated by the low temperature effect and zero point motion instead of the of the term related to the phonon frequencies and, and temperature. So what you observe in the dielectric constant is uh, the, the bar at low, which is a saturation of the dielectric constant at a low temperature. So in this case, again, you see that very tiny difference due to mostly uh, the limits of density functional theory can produce uh, big effects, of course, on the dielectric constant. So you have the, um, well, the Bose-Einstein statistics, basically, in which you have uh, one part uh, with a frequency divided by, uh, by KBT, right? And as KBT goes down, it is dominated by the plus one half term at the end. So basically, the population of the, your mode does not vary. And this is the population of your mode changes the size of the vibration, and the size of the vi vibration is typically controlling also the frequency of the mode. So now, something that we couldn't do also with DFT is to observe the evolution of the uh, window of stability of the parallelic phase as a function of the strain. And this is was, what was done here between 0 Kelvin and 300 Kelvin. So this is including zero point motion. So again, this is not actually something that you can do easily with DFT. And the idea was to observe the evolution of the electrostrictive properties of this material. So electrostriction is uh, the, the reaction of uh, the material to an electric field. And it is actually linked to the reaction with, with polarization. So this will be the, the, um, the position of the tantalum atom. And what we find is that, indeed, especially if you start tuning the materials with strain, you should be able to get a strong electrostrictive response even at higher temperatures. So to conclude, I think it is clear now that machine learning interatomic potentials with density functional accuracy open new possibilities, at least from the DFT side. And they are also progressively predating previous interatomic potentials although some uh, length and uh, size scales are still not accessible at the, at the moment. Uh, selecting and producing data for training is, I think, one of the main challenges that, that still has to be completely addressed in the case of those big systems with uh, uh, complex physics. And the performance is the key, because this is really why they are starting to, to be very successful. As is user-friendliness, so integration with molecular dynamic software, uh, this kind of problem. And this is actually why we in the group stopped uh, developing our own methods and starting becoming uh, ourselves more users uh, 
of uh, methods from group that focus on the development of the methods and the computational aspects of the problem. And to finish, the reliability and fidelity of those potentials uh, really have to be questioned at all times because, for instance, even if interatomic potentials have uh, low accuracy and you can question their quantitative ability to, to assess experimental findings, at the end, you are still dealing with a controlled model, so you are doing a simulation of something you, in principle, understand. Although, when you start talking about 100 parameters, you can also have doubts about that. But here, in our case, it is really difficult to understand what are the limits of the model, at least if we can be sure that we fit density functional theory, that is something, but it is also difficult to, to draw clear conclusions from that. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I thank all the, the collaborators for, for this work.